It'll be great. Do you remember kickball? How many of you remember kickball? Uh, by the way, if you ever made the mistake of trying to play it with a bat, you learn real quick that the bat bounces back and hits you right in the face. I won't tell you how I learned that, but uh, it hurts, just so you know. So when you were a kid and they were getting ready to play kickball, some of you were excited and some of you dreaded it because you knew the way they were going to do it. They were going to have Billy and Johnny, who were the two jock kids who were doofuses, pick teams. And they were going to pick the cool kids, and then they were going to pick their buddies, and then some kid was going to pick last. So even if you weren't the last kid to be picked, which David said he was, even if you weren't the last kid to be picked, if you were like me, you felt bad for the last kid to be picked. You always tried to encourage him. And so then when I became a coach years later, I learned how to just go one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, all the twos here, all the ones here. But then the kids figured that out. So the cool kids would put some nerdy kid between them. So then I started going one, two, three, four, five, six, 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 one, threes and fives go over there. Everybody else over here it was awesome. They never could figure it out because that involved math, which the jocks couldn't do. So here's the deal. You know how it feels to be left out? Today, when we talk about being chosen, we're going to look at this idea. And people are always so concerned about election, and we got to talk about this and that. And they miss the whole point of what these verses in the book of Romans talk about. And so today, we're going to talk about this, and I'm going to talk about the big picture of what does I am chosen mean? And, and here's what I I'm, There's three th questions I want to ask you today, and they are... Are you growing in the awareness of God's love for you? Are you burdened for anyone you know who's not a Christian? Is there a burden? Do you, are you praying for anyone who's not a Christian right now? And are you filled? If you're a Christian, are you filled with more grace? Because here's the deal today. If you're listening to this message or you're here this morning or you're watching online or maybe you're checking it out three years later online and... You know, now it's 2028 20, and the pastor's gone to be with Jesus and somebody checks out the, I hope not. But anyway, so, so that's only six years. I got to be careful. Anyway, so 2094. Uh, okay, we'll go with that. But here's the deal. So if you're here and you're not a Christian or you're watching online, here's the deal. I believe that one of the gravest errors that has happened with Christians is we don't recognize or live in. The love that God has given us. Let's look at point one and then I'll tell you a story and maybe that'll help you to get started on this. Number one, God is with you and loves you. Now listen, I want that to sink in. I want that to be, by the way, uh, if you're not living in Florida and you want to know what Florida's like, uh, take a shower. Uh, don't dry off. Just put your clothes on. That's exactly what it felt like this morning when you walked outside. Now, more than that, I want you to be inundated with God's love. Years ago, when I was in college, we could walk to the beach. And so one night there was a tropical storm. And so my roommate Scott and I walked down to the seawall. And some of you have heard this story. And all of a sudden, we're looking at these huge waves are hitting the seawall. And all of a sudden, I'm looking over this seawall. It's about this high, about this high. And I'm looking over the seawall. And I realize there is water. It's nighttime. But I can see the crest of water eye level. And I thought... Oh, no. And so I ducked behind the wall. But Scott did not. Because I'm not a good friend, as he told me later and has told me every year since. For the last 30 years, he's let me know, you are not a good friend. Because the water soaked him, went over me. And I stood back up perfectly dry. And he looked at me and went, are you kidding me? Then we had to walk a mile back to the school, and I walked back to the school. Dude, that was fun. Hey, wasn't that cool? Those huge waves. And Scott walked back like this. You ever had that in your shoes? Just Now, here's the deal. I want you, as Paul says later, to understand how much God loves you so much 
that everywhere you go, no matter how bad your day is, whether you are in the hospital for tests or whether you're home relaxing on the porch or whether you're swimming in the ocean, whatever you're doing, I want you to carry the, the understanding of God's love so much with you that it comes out of you everywhere. So that you're not full of anxiety and frustration and anger and disappointment, but instead you're walking, understanding God's presence is with you and his love is with you. When you're ADD, you make a lot of noises with your mouth. I'm sorry. It's a, it's a habit I've gotten into over the years. So let's read what Paul says in Romans 8. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us a couple of things? No, all things. He knows what you need, right? Who will bring any charge against those who God has chosen? Time out. Let me answer this for some of you. Sometimes it's you. Sometimes you're the one looking in the mirror and going, what a failure, what a jerk, what a doofus. You have never made it. You blew it. You messed up and all the things. So sometimes the accuser's us. Now, sometimes it's actually the enemy, but sometimes the enemy doesn't even have to help us. It's us. So let's just be honest. And then he says this, who will bring any charge against those who God has chosen? It is God who justifies, which means just as if I've never sinned. And then he says, who then is the one who condemns? This is really cool. This is the same word in John chapter 8 where Jesus says to the woman, no one condemns you. Basically, I said, she says, who condemns you? And he says, no one, neither do I condemn you. So this is the exact same word. So Paul's referring back to, hey, it's not Jesus that's condemning you. And then he continues, no one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was also raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is interceding for us. Time out. Let that, let that sit on you for a minute. Jesus, right now, is praying for you. He's the one interceding for you. There's not an in-between person that you need to pray to. Jesus is the one. So when you say, Jesus, I need help, he goes, I'm already on it. He intercedes for you at the right hand of the Father. He's right there. And then it continues. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And then I love this. He gives us like everything that could happen to us. Shall, tr shall trouble or hardship? Some of you are there this year, right? Some of you are there right now. Trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, no clothes. I say that because I'm country. And if I say that word, you'll all laugh about it for the next hour. No clothes or danger or sword. Thank God we haven't had that one, right? As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We're considered sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced, if you haven't got the point yet, Paul gets excited. I'm convinced neither death nor life or angels or demons or the present or the future or any powers or height or depth or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us. From the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you don't hear anything else I say today. If Scott, if you need to take a nap, it's okay, buddy. Get this. All right? Hang on to this. Why? Because if you and I will begin to understand how much God loves us. To the point that we're soaked with it. That everywhere we go, we understand God loves me. So on your worst day, when everything is falling apart, when everything goes wrong, when that guy cuts you off in traffic, I was driving yesterday, Kristen and I were together, and I'm very ADD, so I'm looking in my side mirror at this truck that's trying to get into my lane, and I'm like, oh no, they're not letting him in. Well, he decided he was coming anyway. Boom, his new truck. Nice dent in the back. He thought he was in the right. But when you cut into traffic, whether anybody wants to let you in or not, guess what? He's wrong. And I said, he, he took three seconds. He could have waited just a little longer, even taken the detour and turned around. And now he's going to wait hours 
for a policeman. And then he's going to wait hours at a shop. And then he's going to take days and phone calls. Why? Because he got in a hurry. On your worst day where you make a dumb decision and think, I'm a big truck, you get out of my way. <laughs> oh, they didn't get out of my way. Oops. On that horrible day when the doctor says, we just got your test back, that you'll know God's love. On that great day, that best day, when they say you got the promotion, that you'll know God's love. Neither height nor depth. Why? Because when you walk around understanding how much God loves you, it changes you. And what's cool about that is other people start to notice. I never forget when I first gave my life to Christ, one of my friends saying to me, what's different about you? It was like the best compliment I could have ever gotten. They weren't saying, you're cool mullet. It's getting there. Somebody said I should grow a mullet again. I'm thinking about it. If you love me, Jesus, uh, John, in John, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commands. And I'll ask the Father and he'll give you another advocate. An advocate is a lawyer, but it's a good lawyer. It's a lawyer that's on your side. He said, I'll give you somebody that's on your side to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world can't accept him because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. And so here's the deal. When people talk about they're hearing God's voice, what they're really talking about is the promptings of the Holy Spirit where you're praying or you're reading your Bible or you're spending... By the way, if you want to know more about God's love, you've got to spend time in His Word. If you're watching the news all the time, guess what? You're going to forget. Why? Because they're trying to set a different agenda for you. Their, their agenda is fear and anger. Remember? Did you forget this week that it was fear and anger? God's agenda is what? Love and grace and truth and peace. and It's very different, isn't it? So you spend time in God's word and what happens? The Holy Spirit speaks to your heart, prompts you. That's why every once in a while I'm in prayer. I'm spending time. I got a, I got a prayer journal on my iPad that I really like. And so I'm, I'm doing my prayer. And all of a sudden I feel like, you know, you ought to call so-and-so today. So I say, Alexa, schedule appointment for 10 a.m. What is your appointment? Call Bob. Got it. I'll remind you of that appointment. Thank you, because I'll forget. And I call Bob later that morning, and he says, Hey, how did you know to call me? How did you know what was going on? I go, because I'm smart. <laughs> and that's exactly what Bob does. He laughs, and then I say, Because I was praying this morning, I felt like I was supposed to call you. Remember that God is with you and is for you. My hope is no matter what's going on in your life, that his love would be so knocking you over and you're so covered that when you walk out in the humidity in the morning, you'll be like, hey, that's not even half as much as God loves me. Now, if you can get if you can understand God's love more than humidity, then you're starting to get it. Number two, God desires for us to be saved. Are you burdened for anybody who doesn't know Christ? If not, then do you really appreciate what God's done for you? See, when you see somebody who's angry and frustrated, you shouldn't be like, I can't believe they're angry and frustrated. You should be like, you know what? Maybe they're not a believer. By the way, there's a lot of people who call themselves a Christians who are not. Did you know that? There's a lot of people who live in the garage that aren't cars. And there's a lot of people who say, I'm a Christian because they've been to the church. But they've never really surrendered their life to Christ. And they are, listen, listen, they're miserable. Because they don't understand what God's done for them. And when we talk about God's love, they have no idea why. Because right now they're enemies of God. That's why they're so angry all the time. Don't be surprised that the world is angry. Don't be surprised that the world is scared. But if you're a believer and you're living in fear and anger then you're not soaked in God's love. Because when you're soaked in God's love, guess what? You got surgery coming up. Okay, it's going to end one of two ways. And both of them are good news. Right? I, had somebody, I got a surgery coming up and somebody said to me this morning, are you worried about your surgery? So I said, no, I'm worried about my wife while I'm in surgery. I'll be asleep. She'll be awake. 
I worry about her. I don't worry about me because one of two things is going to happen. I'm going to wake up and go for recovery or I'm going to wake up and go, Jesus, what are you doing here? And he'll go, <laughs> shouldn't have used that as a sermon illustration. <laughs> Romans chapter 10. If you declare, and this word for declare is like um, country people. I declare. Remember that? You maybe didn't have a country grandma. I had a country grandma. I declare, Eric, you're the loudest boy ever. Well, she was really glad because my grandfather, I was the only person my grandfather could hear. I declare. What does it mean? It means to agree. To agree with Jesus. So if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, it doesn't mean that you just say it. It means that you agree with it. Is Jesus really Lord of your life? And what does the Lord mean? Boss. In charge. King. Is Jesus really in charge of your life? If you declare with your mouth the Lord, that Jesus is Lord, and believe, and that's the word for put your trust in. I'm going to show you that with this chair in a minute. In your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified, with your mouth that you profess and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. For the same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. And listen to this. You're worried about election. You're like, well, am I elect or am I not? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's what you need to think about. So you have a friend who doesn't know the Lord? Well, then pray. Lord, would you help them to call on you? It's not like you call on Jesus. Jesus, I want to get saved. And he goes, I'm sorry. I didn't elect you. He's called the church to be elect. We know that for sure. All the other stuff, you can debate forever, and I don't really care. I just want my friends and my family and the people that I care about to call on the name of the Lord. Why? Because I want them to be in heaven with me. One day we'll all be sitting at a big table, and there'll be people who said, Hey, <laughs> you know that guy who came to your church who wasn't much of an example? Oh, you're talking about Paul. Yeah, Paul! He's the one who got me to come to Christ. And that's why I'm here today. Why? Because when your love overflows to other people, you not only care about them, but they notice in you something different. In John 3, 14 and 15, Jesus said this, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes, and that's the same thing in Greek, to put their trust in, may have eternal life in him. Now, what does it mean to trust? Now, I can study this chair. And I've seen chairs like this. The bar stool sits about this height. And, and I can check out this chair enough to know. And, I, and you've all seen broken chairs before, right? You look at it and the bottom's falling out, right? And you know, don't trust that chair. But I don't know everything about this chair. But I know some things about this chair. I will never know everything about I am not visiting the factory to find out about this chair. But it's okay to check the chair out and then go, you know what? I'm going to put my faith in this chair. Don't mix up knowing about Jesus, reading some scripture about Jesus, understanding about Jesus with Jesus is Lord. Putting your faith in Jesus. Don't mix those two up. There's a lot of people who call themselves Christians who love to talk about the chair. They, know, they may know more than you about the By the way, Satan knows more about the Bible than you do. They know all about the chair, but have they trusted in Christ? Make sure you've trusted in Christ. And by the way, if you struggle with that, you may have to pray this prayer. God, I'm not sure if I've trusted you or not, but from now on, I want to trust you. God, I don't know if I've ever given you my life, but from now on, I want to give you my life. That's a prayer that he honors. And you pray that other people wouldn't just know about Jesus, but that through your witness, through your love, through your care that they would come to know him. Number three, we are saved by grace, not works. Let me show you what grace is like. Imagine sin is like rain and grace is like an umbrella. Now, I know you're not supposed to open this inside. I got you. We've got plenty of room up here. I'll be really careful. Now, here's the thing about grace, right? How can I help this umbrella to keep me from the rain? Put my hand over it. 
Hold it with two hands? No, just keep it over me. You don't help grace. When God gives you his grace, you just trust him and say, Jesus, I trust you. I put my faith in you. And the Bible says at that point, he gives you his grace. Not that you earned it. You can't do any. You standing over the umbrella does not make the grace better. Your works do not help God to be better at grace. Listen to what Paul says here in the next chapter. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by works. No, chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were by grace, if it were, then grace would no longer be grace. Listen to what Philip Yancey wrote. The notion of God's love coming to us free of charge, no strings attached, goes against every instinct of humanity. The Buddhist eightfold path, the Hindu doctrine of karma, the Jewish covenant, and the Muslim code of law, each of these offer a way to earn approval. Only Christianity dares to make God's love unconditional. Ephesians 2, Paul says this, For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so no one can boast. Years ago, Zig Ziglar was trying to lose weight. He looked in the mirror and he went, oh no. And I don't know if you've ever done the oh no mirror look. Don't ever do a jumping jack in the mirror. Let me just tell you that one, okay? Give you a little advice, right? So he looked in the mirror. Did I say that out loud? I meant to to keep that inside. So he looked in the mirror and he went, oh no. And he had a choice. He could put a fat picture of him up on the wall and go, oh, I'm a mess. I'm a mess. I'm a mess. Or he could take a picture from when he was in shape and put it on the wall and go, that's where I want to be again. Listen. If you want to move towards understanding the love of God so much that it overflows out of you so that you don't walk in fear and you don't walk in anger, but you walk in his love and you pray for your friends because you love and care about them. And you understand that God's grace is bigger than you could ever earn. And you rest in that grace. The only way you can do that It's by looking at Christ. Understanding that you didn't earn it. You can't get there. You're not good enough, smart enough, have it together enough. You're not disciplined enough. You blow it. You mess up. You sin. The Bible says all have sinned. But it also says when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ, you've never put your faith in him. Maybe you know about him. Maybe you've been checking out the claims of Christ. If you're ready to put your faith in him, I'd love to talk to you today about what it means to surrender your life to him. Maybe you're here today and you're a Christian, but the truth is, (laughs) maybe you've gotten off the chair a little bit. Maybe you've been trusting in your works. Maybe you haven't paid any attention to anybody around you who's not a Christian. Hey, be overwhelmed by his love and those things will become natural. You'll care about your friends. You'll pray for your friends. Why? Because you're soaked. You're soaked in his love. That's my prayer for you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. I thank you for your love. I thank you that we are chosen by you, not because we're good enough or smart enough or have it together enough, but because of your grace. So, Lord, I pray we could put our faith in you. Father, for those who are Christians whose faith has wavered, I pray that you'd renew our strength because of your love. Lord, for those of us who've forgotten what it's meant to be overwhelmed with your love, show us how deep and high and wide the love of Christ is for us so that we can walk every day in it, so that our friends would notice our love for you, our love for others. Lord, thank you for this time today. In Jesus' name, amen.